Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri and head of Prophetic Research Ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. You know, when President Obama was running for, uh, to be president in the United States, I, I was telling everybody, you know, he was claiming he went to a Christian church in Chicago, uh, which was a bunch of baloney. Uh, he was going there, but he really wasn't Christian. He joined there because that's what he had to do to get elected in certain places. Uh, but I went around telling everybody that I thought that he was a Muslim, still a Muslim. Well, it appears that I'm wrong. And I don't mind being wrong every now and then, but uh, I'm afraid that I'm wrong for the wrong reasons, I guess, or something like that. Uh, I don't think Obama is a Christian. I don't think he's a Muslim. I think he's everything to all religions. Uh, take a look at this article. Hindus loud Obama for celebrating Diwali in White House. Hindus have applauded U.S. President Barack Obama for celebrating Diwali in, White, in the White House in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday. Acclaimed Hindu statesman Rajan Zed in a statement in Nevada commended Obama for becoming the first U.S. president to personally grace the occasion which was held in the historic East Room. Obama reportedly lit a ceremonial dia, which is an oil lamp amidst the chanting of mantras, and bowed respectfully before a Hindu priest. Obama reportedly said on the occasion, this coming Saturday, Hindus, Jains, Sikhs, and some Buddhists here in America and around the world will celebrate this holiday by lighting diyas or lamps which symbolize the victory of light over darkness and knowledge over ignorance. And in that celebration, uh, and in that spirit of celebration and contemplation, I want you to remember that word, I am happy to light the White House dia and wish you all a happy Diwali and a Sal Mubarak. Uh, boy, some of the words these people come up with. Anyway, um, apparently he is having, a, he, I mean, I saw the video on this. I saw a news clip on it. And uh, I thought, good grief, where have we gone to in this country when the president of the United States, and I want you to get this image now, the president of the United States on his inauguration, uh, of course, he has uh, Rick Warren uh, pray the prayer, and he prays the prayer in the name of the Muslim Jesus, Isa, but he's holding his hand on a Bible and he's swearing uh, to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. And, uh, but then he's, uh, he's going to apologize, he's apologizing to all the Muslims. He declares that the United States of America is the largest Muslim nation in the world. And now he's celebrating, <clears throat> what, what is this, uh, Diwali in the White, in the White House. Uh, with, these, uh, with these Buddhists and all these guys in tow and uh, lighting one of their ceremonial lights and proclaiming uh, uh, this uh, celebration of contemplation, uh, the victory of knowledge over ignorance and all this garbage that's going on. And, and he actually has what he calls the White House Dia or the White House Lamp. Now, I did a little research because I am unfamiliar with this particular practice. And so I did a little research, and this is from uh, wikipedia.org. Uh, uh, Diwali is properly known as the Festival of Lights. The most significant spiritual meaning is the awareness of the inner light. Now, that is exactly the same thing that the New Age movement talks about. It's what's being promoted in the contemplative uh, New Age emerging church that's going on. And I have an article about it. We're going to talk about it in a little bit. Uh, but that inner light is the same inner light that, that is, um, is talked about in Freemasonry. It's talked about in Gnosticism. Gnosticism has this, they call it the spark of divinity inside of everybody. The inner light. Uh, you'll hear people talk about, you know, you, you search for the truth on the inside of you. Some of the emerging church leaders are quick to pick up on this, and uh, they're saying that God is within all of us, and when you go into this contemplative prayer, meditative prayer practice, uh, that you are speaking to the God, and you can hear the God that is inside of you. And so Buddhism... And uh, all the New Age uh, concepts and all of what's going on in the Rick Warren Emerging Church, all of this is, I mean, it's all just sort of gelling together. And now the President of the United States has given this stuff, uh, uh, he's given it at a high profile 
by practicing this, practicing this in the East Room of the White House. Uh, let me look at some verses here on what God said. Now, there is only one true God. It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His name is Jehovah. He is revealed to us as Jesus Christ. There is only one true God. And God had very, very strict warnings to Israel about how they were to about how they were to only worship one. I mean, you remember the commandment, don't you? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter twenty three. He says this, and in all things that I have said unto you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods, neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. There is a strong warning given to us in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Ye shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 4, For they shall turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars. Now here's what Obama should have done. Uh, when he was in the White House and these guys, of course, he, was, he did this by invitation. These guys didn't just march in and say, we're going to do this pagan prayer practice in the East Room, Mr. President. These people were invited in to do this ceremony. But here's what he should have done. You shall destroy their altars break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. That's what he should have done, but that's not what he did. And I, and I, can, just, I can just tell you, if you go study what God told the Israelites in the Old Testament. And, and you know, it, it'd be hard to just point it down to one place, but if you just go study what God said to the Israelites in the Old Testament, read the book of Deuteronomy, read Leviticus, read what the prophets said. They got in trouble when they started building images and they started praying to gods, to false gods, including the God that is within themselves. They got in serious serious trouble. And, and, and I'm doing a lot of research right now, and I'm going to kind of give you a preview of some things I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of research right now on um, Dan Brown's new book, The Lost Symbol. And um, the, you, the Freemasons want you to think, and there's a lot of evidence, uh, they want you to think that America was started strictly as a Freemason experiment. Um, I don't believe that. I believe that there was a heavy Freemasonic influence, not only at the beginnings of our country, but now in these days that we're living in right now. But I truly believe that God's people were looking for a land to worship God in freely, and they settled upon this land. Now, the devil came in quickly and started, uh, started taking, that, taking that away and destroying uh, the very foundation of what our country was established on. But I'll be honest with you, I, I see a lot of things and I, I see that, you know, yes, there is some, some Masonic influences, but I also clearly see the foundation of our country being this Bible right here. And since that was the foundation of our country, um, I truly believe with all my heart that there are certain things out of this Bible that apply to the United States of America. One of the things that will trip God's trigger, go read Deuteronomy 28. One of the things that will trip God's trigger in a nation is when they, they start going away from his laws and his statutes and they start worshiping other gods. The President of the United States has an obligation, a moral obligation, in, in my opinion, to lead the country in righteousness. But right now, He's leading the country uh, into the acceptance of all the religions of the world, and including not just saying, well, you know, if they want to be Buddhist, let them be Buddhist. He's not doing that. He's actually participating in the ceremony uh, of these Buddhists in the White House. You, he's, he's bowing and, and, and giving obeisance to these priests. We'll see what happens as we move on. Besieged Tsar... EEOC Chief Safe, Obama tells homosexual crowd, 
President, and this, I want you to listen to this. President Obama last night received a warm welcome at the annual dinner of the Homosexual Support Group Human Rights Campaign, promising, promising to sign hate crimes legislation, to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and the Defense of Marriage Act, and to continue supporting his besieged appointments as safe schools czar and head of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, World Net Daily revelations about Kevin Jennings, the safe, uh, safe school czar, and uh, Kai Feldblum, his EEOC nominee, have resulted in criticism in Congress and from groups concerned about their actions and statements from the past. A dozen members of Congress demanded Friday about that Obama dismiss Jennings following World Net Daily disclosures about his past, including an incident in which he counseled a 15-year-old student to keep quiet about being seduced by an older man. Uh, Obama goes down, if you look at the bottom of the article there, Obama says, I'm here with a simple message. I am here with you in that fight. Now, he's trying to, the, these guys are promoting the idea that homosexual sex is morally good. The President of the United States come out, comes out and says, I'm in that fight with you. The thing that struck me as soon as I read that is, who is he fighting? We know who he's fighting with. He's fighting with the Hindus, the Muslims, the Buddhists of this world. We know that he's fighting with them. Now he's fighting with the homosexual um, rights uh, activist in this country. He is fighting with them. And who is it that he's going to be fighting? Well, me, number one, he's going to be fighting. The President of the United States is going to be fighting me, you, and everybody who believes in a Judeo-Christian morality. And that is that we believe in the sanctity of marriage between one man and one woman and anything else, including, including shacking up and including all the other things that everybody else is doing. Those things are wrong and detrimental to a free society. They are detrimental to our country. The moral fabric of our country is, uh, is uh, being fought against in this country, was by the homosexual activists. Now the president, the, the, the most powerful man in the world is going to be fighting on the side of the homosexual activists in this country. He's going to be fighting people like me and you. But ultimately, he's not fighting us. Here again. He's fighting this right here. He is, he is fighting against the Word of God and God Himself. Now, he might win the country. Barack Obama might win the country. But ultimately, if he continues in this course, he will lose the war. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? And that's what Obama's been trying to do. He's been trying to gain the acceptance of the entire world so that everybody looks at him. I mean, he is the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, I couldn't believe that when I heard that. I mean, it's, it's not like I hate Obama. I don't hate him. I pray for him and have pray and will continue to pray for him. But uh, why in the world did he get the Nobel Peace Prize? But he's out there trying to get everybody to like him. He's out there trying to get to gain the acceptance of the entire world. And I would say, what shall a prophet a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He might actually win the, um, the, the fight that he's trying to fight with the homosexuals, the hate crimes legislation. We have an article about that. He might actually win this saying, but what will he have gained in, in time and eternity? And I'll say to you, I, I love my country. I love my church. I love the things that God has given me in this world. But ultimately, the, ultimately the, those things are going to pass away. They're going to, be, they're going to go away. I won't stay married to my wife in eternity. I'm not a Mormon. Um, my kids are my children, and I love them dearly. The decision that they make to go to heaven is their decision. I can't make it for them, but I can teach them right. And so ultimately, when I stand before the judgment throne of Almighty God, um, everything that I've had in this life, Solomon talks about this in the book of Ecclesiastes, everything that I've had in this life uh, will mean nothing when it comes to judging me and judging whether or not I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and then worthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And so whether even if we lose our country, if we lose everything in this world, we still have a country that is truly our home, and that is the kingdom of heaven. Here's another czar of Obama, Sunstein. We've talked about him. He says economic crisis could usher in socialism. Uh, economic crises can be used to usher socialism, socialism in the United States, argued President Obama's newly confirmed regulatory czar, Cass Sunstein. In his 2004 book, The Second Bill of Rights, Sunstein used the precedent of the Great Depression to point out that historic economic crisis provided the most promising conditions for the emergence of socialism in the United States. With a little nudge or a slight change in emphasis, our culture could have gone and could still go in many different directions, wrote Sunstein in his book, which was reviewed by World Net Daily. We talked about this. We've been talking about this ever since January when we did our first broadcast. You remember um, uh, there is uh, the uh, Henry Kissinger in the floor of the um, the stock market and telling everybody that this financial crisis could bring us into a new world order. And, and, and immediately we began to think that maybe this crisis that we were in didn't just happen. It was pushed. It was orchestrated to bring us into a, a, a new world order, a new world order of socialism, communism, and eventually a global regime. And speaking of that, uh, this was uh, from uh, PrisonPlanet.com. Waco siege enforcer to rule over global police force. Uh, UN and Interpol officials will meet today to discuss the formation of a global police force that would enjoy access to a worldwide database of DNA, biometric, and fingerprint records. The effort will be spearheaded by a man known as the Enforcer, who helped federal authorities both conduct and cover up the murderous Waco siege, which killed 76 people in 1993. Now, uh, of, of, of less concern is the guy that's going to head this global police uh, operation up. Of greater concern to me is the fact that we're going to have a global police force ruling over the entire world. Uh, I want you to think about this, and I want you to go study this in your Bible. Uh, think about the times, maybe in the book of Judges, and the book of 1 Samuel, think about the times when Israel did not have sovereignty over themselves. It was either the Moabites, or the Ammonites, or the Philistines who were ruling over them. How did that work for the Israelites? And I'll just say this, there is a theme and a principle in the Bible that says when we will not obey God's authority, God will place us under cruel authority. And I want you to ponder that. Go read the book of Judges. I mean, they were in like a cycle of, of, of putting themselves under cruel authority because they would not follow the laws and the mandates of God. And God sent the Ammonites in, he'd send the Moabites in, he would send the Philistines in, and they would lord over them. And it should be no wonder to us as born-again Bible-believing Christians of why these things are taking place in our country. Why is it that we, are, that we are at risk for, I mean, here we are, we're losing our dollar bill, we're losing our national, we're losing our constitution, we're losing our national sovereignty, and now they're discussing the fact that there's going to be a global police force. So ultimately, the policeman in your town or the sheriff in your county will not be answerable or accountable to the Constitution of the United States. They will be answerable to a, a global dominated police force. You know, the, just the Bible rings true. Revelation chapter 6, there is a rider on a white horse and his job is to go forth and to conquer uh, and to take peace from the earth. And that's exactly what's happening right now. Then we see the beast rising up out of the sea in Revelation chapter 13. And his job is to conquer the entire world. And so when we talk about a new world order, we talk about a global order or a global police force. That is exactly where we're headed. You know this, I already keep this thing right here. This Bible is right 100% of the time. It is always, always correct. Here's, here's Holdren. John Holdren, one of uh, President Obama's other Caesars, 
that is seeking a planetary regime. White House science czar John Holdren has called for the United States to surrender sovereignty to a planetary regime armed with sufficient military power to enforce population limits on nations as a means of preventing a wide range of perceived dangers from global eco disasters involving Earth's natural resources, climate, atmosphere, and oceans. I, I, I'm telling you, the, the people that are running the country, that are filling uh, this, this country's uh, the highest offices in this land, are being filled with people who hate Christianity, who hate the Bible, and they're being led by a spirit, a common spirit. So a global regime, a planetary regime. I want you to think of Daniel chapter 2. I want you to think of the fourth kingdom that comes to the earth. They are not of this world. They are, you know, the, the UFO, UFO people want to call them the extraterrestrials. Well, you know, maybe that's a good name for them, seeming that they are not from this world. Although they're not uh, aliens in spaceships. They are devils. And they are going to take over. They, they are going to dominate planet Earth. The planetary regime that Holdren is talking about is these people right here. Go read Daniel chapter 2 and read what their agenda is. Their agenda is to mingle themselves with the seed of men. That is what, they, that is, what the, is at the heart of all this. And so do I believe in this conspiracy? Absolutely. That is at the heart of a new world order. That is the ten toes uh, in the image that Daniel saw. And we are talking about a planetary global regime to take over the entire world. And it's being led by a spirit, that spirit of Jezebel. Remember what we learned about Jezebel. Jezebel's job is to transfer authority. In the case of Naboth and his vineyard, Naboth had his vineyard. It was, it was inherited by him from his father. Ahab wanted to buy it. He, Ahab wanted to take it over and take custody of it. And Naboth said, absolutely not. You cannot do that, and I cannot sell my vineyard. Jezebel went and got it for him. That spirit, that harlot spirit that is dominating guys like Holdren, Cass Sunstein, and these others trying to depopulate the planet Earth. Why? Because God gave man dominion over the Earth, and she cannot handle that. So she wants to remove most the people off of the planet to get them off of her back. That's the conspiracy that's happening right now. The hate crimes bill. Is it going to go forward? Well, according to this article right here, the U.S. Of Rep US House of Representatives passed a controversial hate crimes bill last week in a 281 to 146 vote uh, with 131 Republicans and 15 Democrats objecting to the measure. The legislation adds sexual orientation to the list of groups under the protection of the federal law. It also gives states and local jurisdictions federal help in prosecuting hate crimes. The bill passed the House in April as a standalone, but there was enough controversy surrounding it that passage in the Senate was not guaranteed. Todd Nettleton with the Voice of the Martyr says they kind of went about it in a backdoor way. It, it does go to the Senate. Apparently, it will pass the Senate, and from what we understand, partially because it's attached to this defense spending bill, and the president has said he will sign it. So remember, remember what they do. They, they, uh, they can't get this hate crimes legislation passed, and so here it is. I'm going to use my Bible here for a prop. Uh, here is a defense spending bill that uh, everybody, you know, says, well, you know, we got to support our troops, this and that and the other. And so they take the hate crimes law which has nothing to do with defense spending whatsoever. But believe it or not, this is what Congress is good at. Congress is good at taking something that nobody in the country wants and hiding it in a bill somewhere so that they'll pass whatever it is. Okay, And so this is what they did. Here's the hate crimes law. Here is a defense spending bill. And so they stick the hate crimes law somewhere around here. They bury it in there. And uh, they send the whole thing to the President of the United States. And the President signs it. You know, he's got like 20 pins here. And he signs this thing. And undoubtedly, undoubtedly, if, um, if they pass this, uh, this bill, 
uh, without it being too secretive, undoubtedly behind the president. You know, when the president signs a bill into law, he, uh, you know, he's always got like 15 people standing behind him, you know, who are just proud that he's signing the bill. And uh, he's got like 20 pins here. And I think each one of these people get a pin and they say, this is the pen that President Obama used to sign blah, 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 okay? And so anyway, what's going to happen is he's going to sign this law, and standing behind him are going to be about 15 people, probably 10 of them are going to be people who are supporting the hate crimes legislation and are some of these homosexual activists that wanted to get this thing going on. So we're going to keep watching on that. And if you have any news on the process or the progress of this bill, uh, send me an email let me know. Uh, leaked network memo reveals Obama controls your television set. One of our watchers sent this to me this morning, and I appreciate that. On September 10th of this year, the Entertainment Industry Foundation posted a press release informing the world that from October the 19th to the 25th, more than 60 network TV shows will spotlight the power and personal benefits of service, and that this unprecedented block of TV programming is the first wave of a multi-year I participate campaign. You know that what, what's going to happen is uh, NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all these, all these um, networks, uh, you know, History Channel, all these. Uh, they're going to have programming, advertising, things like that that are selling this. Um, volunteer force that Obama's trying to build in this country. And, and when I think about this, it sort of reminded me of, uh, you know, like in China or in the, the old Soviet Union, how you were a citizen and you were a worker in the factory and every, every now and then they called in all the workers in a factory and they all had to sit on these benches and they showed them this propaganda film of Chairman Mao waving to everybody and telling everybody how divine he was and what a great guy he was and how he was helping the people of China, and he was their god, and he was their hero. And of course, there's a member of the, uh, of the political regime in the room so that as the people are watching this, they have to watch it, number one. And number two, when Chairman Mao comes up on the stand and he makes a speech in this film, they all go, oh, there's our Chairman Mao. There's a, and, but secretly, these people hated his guts. And this is kind of what it reminds me of. This is, pro this is government propaganda. Um, what was it? The operation uh, from the CIA. I can't remember what it was. Uh, operation Mockingbird. CIA Operation Mockingbird back in the 50s that uh, actually hired uh, news agents and reporters to report certain things or to have certain things printed or put it out on the radio or put in, in, in uh, TV news shows to, to, to support an agenda from the government. And now we're doing this full scale. Now we're just not getting the news. We're getting, we're going to get TV shows. We're going to get themes that are going to be in advertising or in TV shows about how to be a good little citizen of President Obama. Um, anyway, well, this is 1984, uh, and I've never read the book. Maybe I ought to go back and read the book. Maybe I'll get a copy of that and read it because this just sounds like Orwellian utopia. This is what it sounds like. New stem cell research bill could promote human cloning and destroying embryos. President Barack Obama issued an executive order this year to force taxpayers to fund embryonic stem cell research that destroys human life. Now that the National Institutes of Health has issued the guidelines to implement that decision, a pro-cloning member of Congress wants to open the door further. Representative Diana DeGette, a Colorado Democrat, will soon introduce the Stem Cell Research Enhancement Act of 2009. The article goes on and says DeGette's measure will likely go further and enhance or promote human cloning and the destruction of human embryos. Remember, remember what we've taught through this ministry. This Bible is the Word of God. And God had rules that said you're not to add to or take away from my words that I've written. DNA is the Word of God. It is the book that God wrote, and God's rules still apply. You're not to add to, take away, or mess with DNA. Uh, somebody sent me an article about how, the, and I've, I've already looked into this, uh, about how the new vaccines are going to be DNA-based. 
I'm not getting one if that's, if that's what they are. I'm not getting one. When you start talking about DNA and messing with DNA, you're talking about messing with the Word of God, with the Bible. The Word of God in me, that is my DNA. And I'm not going to have any part of it. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I, think this is, I think this has Tower of Babel written all over it. And I think at some point, mankind is going to get too smart for his own good. It's like handing a pistol, a loaded pistol, to a three-year-old and say, now don't do anything bad with this. Somebody's going to get hurt, and uh, somebody, God's going to have to step in. Uh, somebody sent me this, and I, I mean, I, my eyes shot out of my head when I saw this. American abortion addict reveals she terminated 15 pregnancies in 17 years. A woman has admitted to being an abortion addict after having 15 terminations over 17 years. And apparently she's happy about it. Look at the smile on her face. Irene Viler said she had the abortions not from poverty or fear, but as an extraordinary act of rebellion against her controlling husband who did not want children. The 40-year-old's confession has unleashed a torrent of attacks from anti-abortion activists on the Internet, including death threats and demands for her to be jailed. The cycle of pregnancies and abortions which began when she was 16 and ended when she was 33, was also punctuated by several suicide attempts. Now a successful literary agent with two young daughters, Loretta 5 and Lolita 3, Mrs. Viler has written about her experiences in a memoir called Impossible Motherhood, Testimony of an Abortion Addict, guilty of 15 murders, the murdering of her own child. You know, we sent out a video um, this month called The Forbidden Practices. Moloch, and God told Israel, don't take your kids and throw them on the altar. Don't make them, be, no, don't make them to be passed through the fire. And I explained that in that video, that basically what happens is, is that people would go, and, and all these gods everywhere, they always require a sacrifice of some kind. Some of these gods are pretty evil, and they demand a human sacrifice. And so here parents taking their babies, throwing upon the, the god Moloch, hearing the baby's flesh sear on the hot brass uh, as they're being burned, drums and chanting and rock music being played in the background so they can't hear the screams. And why are they doing this? What would, what would, what would provoke people to take their own children to throw them on the fires of Molech? What would cause them to do that? And it's, it's very simple. People do that to appease the gods. They do that to appease the gods so that um, the gods will re render some sort of favor to them. They'll get personal gain and personal benefit by having their children killed. That's what abortion is. That's at the heart of abortion. That's at the heart of the embryonic stem cell debate, is that people are trashing their children, things that they have conceived in their bodies. They're trashing their children in an effort to improve their quality of life. What a sick society we live in today, people. What a sick society. Willow Creek and Focus on the Family promote contemplative prayer opponents. This is our part of our Church Watch segment. Uh, Willow Creek, that is, uh, let's see here, that is um, Bill Hybels up there in Chicago, I believe. Willow Creek and Emotionally Healthy Spirituality will join forces to promote contemplative prayer. Uh, starting on September, 5th, September 15th, Willow Creek will distribute the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Churchwide Study, which includes a kit, the EHS book, the EHS work group, or group workbook, the teaching DVD, and the daily office. Emotionally Healthy Spirituality was co-founded by Pete and Jerry Scazzaro. It is an organization that is supposed to apply emotional health to biblical spirituality in order to, here it is, look at that word here, transform leaders. I'm telling you, be very wary in your church, in your church's Sunday school literature or their youth group workbooks or whatever it is. Be careful of your pastor when he's telling you, now we're going to have this transformational service or I'm going to preach a, a sermon series that will transform your marriage. It will transform your life. Listen to me. 
Preachers cannot preach transformation. The transformation that a person needs is was done at the cross of Jesus Christ. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that takes place at the cross. A preaching series will not do it. Having a, a mo good emotional health and spirituality will not transform you. So here... Uh, Bill Hybels and um, and um, and um, focus on the family. We'll see that here in a second. They're they're talking about the ability to transform leaders. Now, if you have people in your church that are leaders in your church and they are not transformed by the cross, why are they leaders in your church? Why is it that we have to take people who have been in the church who are supposed to be saved and and transform them? so that they can be more effective leaders. I'm telling you that's to be done at the cross of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God already in us transforms us, and all of a sudden we don't want to do the things that we used to do. We want to do new things, and being led by the Spirit is what it's all about. But you, you guys, you, you understand this. You folks that have come out of the Nazarene church, you have seen this. You have seen this over and over and over again, how, these, how the certain men crept in unaware. This is what Jude said. Certain men crept in unawares into your denomination. They started talking about transformation. They started talking about prayer practices. They started talking using all this lingo that you had never heard before. And they stole your denomination. It's happening in the Southern Baptists. It's happening in Free Will Baptists. It's happening. It's even happening in the Independent Baptists. It's happening all over the place. The certain men are creeping in unawares. And they're stealing away our, our ministries and our churches. And they're all using the same language. Transformation, transformation, transformation. Um, anyway, tenant four, the 12 foundational tenets. On the website states, the church today parallels that of the Roman Empire in the 4th and 5th century. Following the example of Moses, Elijah, and John the Baptist, and Jesus, the desert fathers fled to the desert to seek God. We too must find our deserts in the midst of our activity for Christ. We can learn a great deal from the contemplative monastic tradition as we seek to remain rooted as we engage the world with the gospel. Contemplative monastic tradition. Uh, let's see here. The father of contemplative prayer, Thomas Burton, is widely recognized as the person in the 21st century who promoted contemplative prayer. On page 17 of Spiritual Classics, edited by Richard Foster and Emily Griffin, it is said his, Merton's interest in con contemplation, led him to investigate prayer forms in Eastern religion. Zen masters from Asia regarded him as the preeminent authority on their kind of prayer in the United States. Also on June 21, 2009, Focus on the Family put an article on their website called Talking Off Our Happy Faces at Church by Lynn Thompson. The article freely promoted the, the Scazzeros and their book, The Emotionally Healthy Church, despite the Scazzeros' promotion of contemplative prayer. I'm telling you that if it's a big ministry, it's probably either corrupt now or on its way to corruption. Uh, we, are just, we are just being flooded by this stuff. So you can't trust Willow Creek. You can't trust Focus on the Family anymore. By the way, I mean, this goes back several years. Focus on the Family was had, had guys out there promoting Harry Potter as some sort of uh, good role model for our Christian kids. You know, we ought to teach Harry Potter role models in our Sunday school. Uh, this is where we're headed in our world today. It's, 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 and I feel sorry for people that have lost their denomination. I feel sorry for people that have lost their church. I feel, I mean, I do. I feel sorry for you. Uh, we're still being contacted by people all over the country, even all over the world, that said that they've lost. They, they had to leave their church because of some of the things that were going on in there. And uh, I, I feel sorry. My heart goes with you, the fact that you've lost everything. Uh, hopefully you won't lose this. And when you won't lose sight of who you are, let me, let me give a, 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 a sort of a recommendation to those of you who home church. Now, I, I could tell you that I don't know that I personally could home church. Maybe if I was in a situation where I had to, maybe I could. I don't know that I personally could home church. And I, and I have prayed about this. I want you to help me pray about this too. Uh, about just doing a video teaching on what, what I think the Bible would say about having a good, decent, and biblical home church. Don't lose sight of the fact that, number one, the Lord's day is the Lord's day and it doesn't belong to you. 
Uh, number two, um, prayer, Bible reading, the preaching and teaching of the Word, if you're going to home church, that has to be done. That is, to me, is absolutely necessary. Don't lose, don't lose sight of the fact that if you are going to home church, that is your church, and there are obligations that go with that, obligations of evangelism, uh, obligations of um, you know, just different things, tithing. Uh, these things, I think, are vital if you are going to home church. And I, and I feel bad for you that you cannot find a group of people that you can agree with, um, that you can worship with, with and fellowship with, because the massive amount of this stuff uh, that is taking over. I've, I've known pastors that uh, have lost their church. They lost their church. Because people in the church say, oh, let's, let's have a praise band, pastor. Pa- how come pastor doesn't want to have a praise band? Well, he's a dictator. And so the, I know a guy. I love him. I love him dearly. They run him out of his church because he wouldn't have a rock and roll band in his church and he preached against it. And they said, out the door, guy. Get out. So my heart goes with you to all you people that have lost. And uh, I'm glad that hopefully we'll, we'll be able to be a blessing to you as the day goes on. You know, President Obama won the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. He won an award. Well, I've come up with my own award. It's called the Baloney Award. And this week, I'm going to give out a Baloney Award. You know, and if you don't live here in America, uh, Baloney is a, um, it's a, it's like a big sausage. And it's just a bunch of junk meat that they threw together. I, I happen to like Baloney. I mean, I really, really I like bologna. I like it just plain cut. I like fried bologna uh, on a sandwich. Man, I love that. Um, but we use the term here in America, we use the term bologna as nonsense or it's a pack of lies or just a bunch of garbage. And so we're going to give out the first ever bologna award uh, to this guy here. This is a video from Extreme Prophetic. I wasn't able to find out a whole lot about uh, who made this video or who was talking here. Uh, but he's talking, he is bragging now that a new thing from God is God is raising dead people back to life. Take a listen to some of what he said. I want to talk to you just for a few moments today about raising the dead. It's a reality that's happening all over the world today in increasing uh, momentum and numbers. Many people are being raised from the dead all over uh, the United States and the third world countries all around the world. It's a very exciting day to be living in. Let me give you a story about how God used me to raise two people from the dead. And maybe that will help you have some courage to do the very same thing. And all of a sudden we come upon this African woman laying uh, face down in the dirt out in this tall grass, uh, dead. I mean very dead, uh, where rigor mortis had set in. I don't know how many hours that takes, but she was stiff. If you moved, you know, one part of her body, all of her body moved. And so uh, I knew she had been dead for a while. So I looked at this woman, and I was mad at the devil that he made her dead to interrupt my meeting. I was a little upset with these guys, and I just looked at that woman, and I said, I command you in the name of Jesus to come to life now. And you know what? She did. She sat straight up out of being totally dead. Her eyes were very wide. I don't know if she'd ever seen a white man. I could not imagine what was going through her mind. She jumped up and began to run as fast as she could away from us. These two African guys that were with me, they chased her down and tackled her. Can you believe that? I said, take it easy, guys. She was just dead. You know, don't hurt her. So he gets the baloney award. And I'll be honest with you. I don't believe a word that he said. I I don't believe one word of what he said. I don't buy it for one second. I have a pastor friend that actually he, uh, uh, he pastors the church that I used to pastor, uh, a little country church down uh, southwest of here. And I, I saw him one day and I said, I said, brother, how's it going? He said, it's awful. He said, there's a guy out there in the community that uh, he is this charismatic guy and he is, uh, he's, he's pulling people out of every church down there. He's making all these, all these boasts and claims about healing and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And he said, now it's gotten to the pact. He's going, he's, it's gotten to the point now he's going around the community telling everybody and bragging that he's raising dead people back to life. And I just went, oh, my goodness. And you know what I told that pastor? I said, Pastor, I said, just hang in there. Just hold on. 
I said, let this pass because it will. I said, pretty soon the gas will run out of this guy's engine and he won't have anything left. And I said, people will follow this for a little while, but then they're going to be starving to death and they're going to be looking at some pastors who actually have some meat to give away and some bread to give away instead of all this candy Christianity that some of these people are, are talking about. And so, uh, pastors, I know this stuff's going around. Hang in there. Hang in there. God knows your toil, your labor, and I promise you, your labor is never in vain in the Lord. Uh, this is from Oak Leaf Church somewhere. I couldn't find out where Oak Leaf uh, Church was. It should be called Fig Leaf Church because that's the kind of shame that they have on them. And here is another church that ha has a new sex series come out. Storybook Sex. New, new series begins October 3rd. They're pushing this sex agenda uh, to get people to come to their church. Uh, to get people to, to get people in the pews. And really all this is, there's two things that are behind this. Number one, uh, what's behind this is money. It's getting people in the church, having a big church, having all the money come in so you as a pastor can feel successful. You can live in a nice house and you can have a nice car and you can have all, you can go to vacations to Hawaii and all this stuff as a pastor. And uh, you can sit out there on the beach in your shorts and sipping margaritas as a pastor, because you have the big church, because you sold sex to everybody. You use sex to market. You know, you talk to anybody who markets and advertises, and they will tell you sex sells. And so use it whenever possible. And so here's a church that's using sex to sell the gospel. But it's not the real gospel. I don't, I don't see, I, it's not there in the Bible, where one of the promises that God made to people who came to him with a broken and a contrite heart over their sins and over their failures, where God said, you know, if you'll just come to me, man, your love life is it's going to be, oh man, you're going to have so much fun. God never said that. Let me tell you how to recognize the Spirit. There's God's Holy Spirit. And, and the key word here is holy. God demands and gives personal holiness. There is a spirit also that runs through a church, a person, a ministry, a country that is a harlot spirit. You figure out which one's running the Oak Leaf Church. I'm going to give you a preview of something uh, I've been working on. I read Dan Brown's new book, The Lost Symbol, 500 page. This is a 500 page brochure advertisement for Freemasonry and for the beast, the Antichrist, 666. You know that guy, Revelation 13. And um, I'm going to give you a little preview. I'm going to show you a, a, an image here up on the screen. Uh, this actually showed up in Dan Brown's book. It's supposedly, and I, don't, I think this is a little bit of artistic license on his part, uh, in that he imagined that there was a room like this in the, um, uh, underneath the capital of the United States, although there might be. I don't know. I've never been there. Uh, but anyway, in a, in a secret room uh, down, way, 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 way down in the basement where nobody can get to, um, they find in uh, the, the character Robert Langdon finds what's called a chamber of reflection. And as Dan Brown's describing this in this book, I remember seeing this. I have a book on Freemason symbols, and that's where uh, this image came from. It's called the Chamber of Reflection. And uh, you see on the table there, uh, there is a skull and crossbones. Now, I'm going to give you a little glimpse into this. We're working on three new videos. Right, I'm doing three new videos right now uh, on uh, Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol. We're going to have them available hopefully in, in the next month or so, next two months maybe. Uh, I've been working night and day on this thing, trying to get it all together. Uh, but anyway, on the table there's a skull and crossbones. Now, if you've seen our videos before, the crossbones uh, is a picture for the X chromosome. The chromosome is where the DNA is stored. That is at the core of the secret of Freemasonry, the New Age movement, Rosicrucians. Uh, what President Obama did in the White House in the East Room with his contemplative prayer service and at the heart of the contemplative prayer movement itself is this idea that you have a divine nature and it's going to come out. And it's all in your DNA. So DNA is at the heart of everything. So 
so the, the crossbones represent the X chromosome where the DNA is stored. The skull represents, guess who, you like this. Where was Jesus crucified at? The place of the skull. Remember, remember Sisera in the book of Judges? And a woman drove a, she, she drove a, a, a stake, a nail, through his skull. The cross driving into the place of the skull. The skull is the Antichrist. It's a picture of the beast. So here you have a, a crossbones and a skull added to it. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men is what that means. Um, anyway, uh, let's see here. Up on the back of the, uh, the wall there, you see the word vitriol. Now, I didn't have a clue what that meant. I didn't know what vitriol meant. I found out it's another name for, for sulfuric acid. It's a dissolving agent. If you remember the image of Baphomet, he has on one arm, he has salve, which means to dissolve, and on the other arm, he has coagula. That is the, that is the theme or the process of turning men into gods. You have to dissolve first and then, and then bring up a new man or a new god. That's what Lucifer promised to Eve in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, and that is at the core of Freemasonry. But here, here it is. Vitriol, and all, in all the Freemasonic literature, they talk about how vitriol has seven letters. Well, the, the number seven is unique in Freemasonry in that it deals with, uh, I, I'm tell, I believe that it points to the seven heads of the beast or the seven spirits of Antichrist. The name Beelzebub is mentioned seven times in the King James Bible. But the, the, they actually tell you that the word vitriol is an anagram for some Latin words. Visita interiora, terre, rectificando, invenies, occultum, lapidum. You'll have to pardon my French, okay? Or, or my Latin, excuse me. I'm not, I didn't take Latin, did say it. Don't know how to pronounce these things. I'm not the Pope in nomine, I'm, you know, I just, I'm not that. But here's what vitriol means in English, visit the center of the earth, and by rectifying, ye shall find the hidden stone. I want you to think about this. Something, and, and masonry, and the whole theme of the lost word is a secret that's buried deep underground. You saw national treasure, right? Okay, so, so you understand something. A secret that is buried deep underground that is going to be revealed one of these days. The Freemasons call it the lost word word of Freemasonry. And I spent years going, I want to know what that word is. What's the word? What's the secret word? What's the lost word? I know what it is now. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. You see, that's Jesus. That's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, God in the flesh, standing at the right hand of the Father right now. That's Jesus Christ. He is the word of God. You have to remember that the Antichrist is another Jesus. He is the Antichrist. He is the replacement for Christ. He is against Christ, and he is the opposite or the false Christ. So he, the lost word of Freemasonry, is the Antichrist. And they believe that it's hidden somewhere, buried down deep somewhere. And it's going to be revealed. It's going to be brought up. Revelation chapter 9, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they hold the beast that was and is not and yet is. The lost word of Freemasonry is buried right now. Way, way, way. It's in the bottomless pit. The lost word is the Antichrist. The secret that's hidden. The, um, the idea that you will become a god one of these days. That whole concept and the formula for that is hidden. It's secret. Uh, all the occultists talked about a, an underground stream uh, that's hell. That's the bottomless pit. One of these days, the secret, the lost word, is going to be revealed. It's the Antichrist coming in the last days. Uh, pray for our ministry. Continue to pray for our work here. Appreciate your support. Uh, appreciate you helping us out if you can. 
uh, by donations, by prayers, or whatever, or whatever God lays on your heart to do. We are at the mercy of Almighty God here, and so far God has been merciful to us, and I have nobody but God to thank. And thank God. If you like what we say, thank God. If you hate what we say, go tell God about it and complain, and maybe God will hear you complain, and God will either straighten me out or he'll straighten you out, one of the two. Anyway, if you want to get on our watchers list, we we'll send out videos every month. If you want to get our watchers list, uh, we give it our, our Bible studies, our uh, Sunday morning sermons, Sunday school lessons. Wednesday night, we're going through the book of Genesis. Uh, you'll get new videos, including the three that I'm working on right now. You'll get those by being on our watchers list. Uh, just send us your name and address, and we'll put you on the list. And we do ask that you help us with a donation of any kind, any amount. Uh, to help with our expenses. Our expenses are starting to, I mean, they're starting to get pretty high now. And uh, I'm not telling you that, oh, we're just so dead broke. And, uh, I mean, I'm not going to lay it on you saying, boy, we're going to have to pull. We're gonna, you won't get your, uh, we're going to have to uh, pull uh, uh, our, our ability to uh, send out uh, our stuff if you don't help us this month. I'm not going to work you like that. I'm going to ask you if you can to help us out. If you can't, don't worry about it. Uh, but uh, call us, write us an email, send Pastor Mike, I want to be put on the list and I can help out a little bit every month. Uh, we absolutely, absolutely appreciate it here. God has blessed us and God is using us and that's what we want. We want to keep being a blessing to you, so keep praying for us and we will pray from you. If you send me an email, say, Pastor Mike, pray for me. I promise you that when I read that email, I'm going to pray for you and, and uh, where two agree is touching anything in heaven or earth, it shall be done. I've uh, enjoyed being with you this week. Sorry I missed last week. was preaching revival in Caulfield and got some people down there that love what we said down there. I got a guy down there that's not real happy with me. He's a pastor, so you pray for him and pray that God will lead him into all truth. I love you. This is Pastor Mike. Thank you so much for praying for us. God bless you. Bye-bye.